Hello, thank you so much for joining us NAC Cannon webinar today on the use of hydrogen as energy carrier and its impact on energy storage by Andre Fern Andres Fernandez in the US. So let's um, go over the introduction uh, slide and uh, just a bit of a housekeeping item. Uh, please log your questions in your go to control panel um, and Andres will address them at the end of his uh, presentation. So Andres is a structural engineer um, and a certified portfolio manager by the PMI. He's based in Houston in the US and has been with WSP since uh, July 2018. Before that, he was country manager for WSP and Golder in Peru and worked extensively for the mining industry. Andres, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Karina, for your introduction. Um, and thank you for hosting me today. Welcome to this webinar. Um, my name is Andres Fernandez. I'm the national market lead for the U.S. Um, the hydrogen economy, which is a position what recently created and the intent of the company was to promote a WSP position in this sector, uh, ensure that we have cross-sector collaboration uh, and also that we are able to leverage our expertise and uh, along different geographies, given our extensive footprint from North to South America, uh, continental Europe, the UK, the Nordics, uh, Australasia, and, and Africa. So there are many capabilities spread all across different geographies. It's important to bring them together and to learn from each other. Uh, another important factor of behind creating this position is to adapt our current capabilities on underground storage, where we are world leaders, to the hydrogen sector. Um, we have been working in this area for many, many decades, since the early 80s, uh, mostly focused on oil and natural gas, and this is a great example of how quickly the market is adapting and how quickly and successfully WSP is adapting to the new technology and to the future ready mentality by really focusing on something like hydrogen um, in, the next, in the next few years. Um, let me start with the, with the presentation. Um, I would like to talk for a few minutes about the concept of the hydrogen economy. And I emphasize the idea of economy because uh, most of us in this call are technical experts in one subject or another. We love technical aspects. We do like to do engineering, but uh, anything that we do, especially around hydrogen, it has to make sense. So it is reasonable to say that we are on an early stage of this uh, hydrogen economy. Therefore, cost efficiency are not achieved yet and we need to make investment from many multiple stakeholders from government to the private industry and engineering companies like WSP to advance this concept and to make it economically feasible. And that's going to be one of the key components in the next few years. So basically, the hydrogen economy, it focuses on the use of hydrogen to decarbonize different economic sectors therefore minimizing, reducing the impact of CO2 emissions than we have been suffering for many, many decades. Uh, many different applications from using as a fuel to elect, uh, power generation, for, to transportation, and especially on those hard to abate heavy industrial use like steel, uh, fertilizer industry, and many, many others. So many different applications, they will all have different volumes, different market values, uh, different technolog technology challenges that we will need to mitigate as we go along, but it has a very wide set of applications across the industry. What are some of the contributing factors uh, to, to hydrogen? And why is this moving so fast? And why is getting so much attention from many different stakeholders? Uh, well, one of the main factors is the potential of hydrogen as an energy carrier. So hydrogen itself, you cannot find it in a natural way. Uh, you have to produce hydrogen, but it has a great potential to carry energy from point A to point B to the end consumers. And once you have the hydrogen and you use it, 
as an energy carrier, it does not emit any CO2. Therefore, it's a clean energy on the end user side of the, of the equation. Hydrogen is really helping many, many companies to uh, rethink the way they decarbonize their process. And it's also a great way to ensure reliability. We all know about ESG and how important it is to focus. It has many different implications on the cost of financing and social responsibilities of the company. We believe at WSP that Hydrogen is gonna play a key role in this ESG approach by many, many companies. It also has a great potential to optimize existing and future assets. And with that, I mean, especially on renewable energies, given that it's so difficult to store energy and renewable energy assets are weather dependent, either solar or wind, therefore you only use plus also market application. And it's the market application component that can be optimized by having an efficient way to store that excess energy, excess meaning no today market usage of that energy because the demand is greater than, than the, sorry, the supply is greater than the amount of energy. Therefore, there is an opportunity here for hydrogen to act as an, um, a way to store energy. Many, many market trends aligning in favor of hydrogen. And just to uh, highlight a few, a few of those, we already talked about the push for CO2 reduction, obviously, Solar and wind power generation, uh, the penetration of these renewable energy assets is increasing very, very quickly, and the cost per kilowatt hour is also decreasing, therefore making it more, more competitive. But as we install more and more renewable energy, there will be also a, a more acute period between surplus and deficit. This graph right here in the bottom left corner it shows a yearly a renewable energy production for California, where you see there are a few months where there is a surplus of energy. And in some spring month, it could be up to 300 gigawatt hour of surplus renewable energy, which is, is a significant amount. However, in other months of the year, there is a deficit of renewable energy. This pattern is, is pretty much across the industry and across different geographies, obviously depending on where you are located and your, uh, your weather pattern, this graph will be inverted summer to winter. Um, cost of uh, electrolyzers is dropping quickly as new technologies develop, of alkaline, um, PEM technology, or any other. And as they achieve mass scale production units, we expect the cost of those electrolysis to come down, therefore making hydrogen cheaper to produce. Another great factor aligning in favor is a, a number of top tier OEM suppliers are developing brand new turbines and are able to blend some percentage, 30, 50% of hydrogen along with natural gas, therefore reducing the overall footprint of the power generating with these new turbines we see a very, very quick market develop, developing in this, in this area that will generate high demand for hydrogen for these new turbines. And also um, the idea that new hydrogen generation location needs to be close to renewable energy sources, it will impose in the market uh, many new challenges uh, to, to address in the few years. And then I'll show you a couple of graphs uh, to, to, uh, to talk about that concept. This uh, graph here on the bottom right corner, it also talks about, uh, now we're gonna be talking about energy storage, different ways to store energy uh, from battery to pump hydro storage, you know, flywheels back in the times and so on. So hydrogen is stored in large quantities in the proper geology is really a great way and the most cost efficient way to store significant amount of, of energy. And this is, a, I, will, I will show you an example that is taking place as, as we speak here in the, in the US. So we talk uh, about producing hydrogen close to renewable energy sources. Um, 
Let me step back for a few seconds, say in the last few decades, the concept has been to install power plants close to the consumers. So you will look at the population density of the country. Uh, I'm just bringing an example of the US right here and, and the industry density, and you will estimate the demand for energy and you will install necessary power plants nearby to supply the last few miles of energy to the different sources. But with hydrogen and renewable energy, it's gonna be a little bit different. And that will impose many challenges in the industry. This graph right here on the left corner is a high level map of renewable energy sources in the US. So as you can see, the more prominent areas for solar is around the Midwest or wind, obviously along the coast, eh, both in California, Oregon, and in the Northeast. Um, hopefully we will also develop some wind capabilities along the Gulf Coast. Also inland, there are good, very good areas for uh, wind generation. But or, however, these areas are far, far away from highly dense population areas. For example, Southern California or the Northeast and along the Southeast uh, Gulf Coast. If to these two factors, you add what we call seasonable variance, which is a annual variance of the overall temperature, you can see that uh, these are very cold areas along the Northeast and Northern US uh, during the winter and mild during the summer. The opposite along the South, very hot during the summer, therefore demanding high level of energy, very mild during, during the winter. So when you combine all three of these factors, you see that to make it efficient, hydrogen would need to be produced fairly close to where renewable energy sources are. I'm, I'm talking about green hydrogen in this case, but these areas are far located from highly density uh, population. Therefore, the challenge will be to transport the hydrogen on pipelines or by means of electrons to those areas of high demand. And one of the key factors, it will be to store energy underground for some period to be able to match the seasonable variance throughout the year. So once again, underground storage in salt formations comes very handy as the, the most cost efficient way to achieve, to achieve that. I, I'm gonna take a, a sh very short detour to talk a little bit about ammonia as an energy carrier. Because uh, ammonia, um, ammonia has been around for, for many decades, right? As an electrol uh, for the fertilizer industry. It, it is a great complement to hydrogen. It's hydrogen rich. And it's pretty much the only way to transport hydrogen overseas by ship. Because as at least as of today, and we don't expect it in the next many years, uh, to store hydrogen in ship is not a viable solution and it could be awfully expensive if we had to do it in liquid hydrogen because of the capex of compressing and cooling the hydrogen and keeping it cool throughout the, the transport. However, there is an existing infrastructure to transport ammonia across the globe with about 120 different ports and are able to um, handle some type of volume of, of ammonia and that will be increased in the next few years. So what we see in the industry is that ammonia could become an excellent energy carrier to transport energy from high locations of renewable energy sources like South America or Canada, both coast, uh, all the way to Europe or to, to Asia. So probably a little bit of a geopolitical shift coming in the next few years as you are able to export renewable energy uh, to, to different geographies. Let me provide a high level overview of how we visualize the hydrogen economy at WSP. And the very first thing I want to say is that this aligns very well with WSP vision to be future ready. Future ready at the uh, ahead of the curve, uh, looking forward to decarbonize the industry and to really serve the, our society. It also aligns very well with WSP ESG objective and overall target to increase uh, overall uh, so-called green dollar revenues or revenue generated 
from or from this uh, green economy. So this is a very uh, dense picture. I apologize for that, but. Um, from bottom left to top right, uh, you have uh, renewable energy sources, either wind or solar, which you're gonna use to produce green hydrogen on an electrolyzer unit. For that, obviously, you need to manage your water supply, water quantity, and water quality. Therefore, water is gonna be an important part of the world process, as well as renewable energy sources, and everything has to do with environmental permitting associated to this process. That's one way to produce hydrogen, so-called green hydrogen, because it's, it comes from renewable energy, but you can also produce hydrogen, uh, or you are currently producing hydrogen in many different ways. The idea here is to capture that carbon and sequester, so you will reduce the CO2 footprint of that carbon. Um, before you inject this hydrogen into the economy, you have to establish a a network of pipeline and underground storage facilities. So the hydrogen will end up uh, at the different end users, whatever it is for hydrogen fuel cells or to adapt power system, data centers, microgrids, et cetera. So for, for underground storage, there are basically three different options. One is reservoir storage. Uh, which is present in many, many different geographies across the globe, which is injecting hydrogen in depleted gas reservoir. This is not a proven technology as of today. There are many research going on. It has many, many challenges. Uh, at WSP, we think we are still many, many years away from a potentially being a, a viable economical uh, option. Another way to store, potentially to store hydrogen would be in hard rock caverns in the form gas at a low pressure, whatever is available or by, by, the, by the geomechanics, but it will probably require heavy steel lining all over, and it will, it will be very, very costly to achieve that objective. So that's another solution that at WSP we don't see economically available in the next few, few years, or not at all. Uh, the only proven technology as of today is to store hydrogen in salt carbon by drilling into soil formations and creating a big, big opening underground. Again, this is a technology that has been very well proven for natural gas for many decades. And there are three existing caverns in the US and another smaller three caverns in the UK under operation as, as of today. So very quickly, I think I'm running out of time. Um, some pros and cons of storing different ways of energy underground from salt caverns to aquifer to depleted reservoirs. Uh, I think we, we already talked about that. But let me get into a very interesting project that WSP is developing right now in uh, Utah. Uh, that's in the Midwest of the, of the US. The project objective, overall objective, is basically uh, our client, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, wants to decarbonize their uh, power generation metrics, and they get power from different sources. One of those is a coal fire power plant sitting in Delta, Utah. The idea is to retire this unit and to bring on board a brand new set of turbines by Mitsubishi that are able to blend natural gas and hydrogen. That way, the CO2 footprint of the power generation metrics will be improved significantly. To do that, uh, the client will need high volumes of uh, hydrogen in a constant and reliable way to feed those, those turbines. And that's where we are developing two uh, salt caverns for a total of 9 million barrels. That's about 1.5 million cubic meters with a total storage capacity between base gas and working gas of about 20,000 metric, metric tons. Just to give you an idea, the total energy able to store in those two caverns will be about 300 gigawatt hour uh, in the US when you account for all the installed batteries, we have about 1.2 gigawatt hour. Therefore, this is a significant improvement in the volume. Um, by the way, this will be the fourth and fifth a pure hydrogen caverns developed in the US. The previous three caverns existing in Texas are focused on the industrial sector, or this one are for green hydrogen. 
Uh, and at this time, um, WSP has developed three out of the five existing hydrogen compatible wellheads in a uh, well bores, sorry, in the in the US. A high overview of the pictures, as I said, the end user the client is LADWP, is situated in Los Angeles Basin. They will get their electrons from this power plant situated in Delta through IPA, Intermountain Power Agency. And our scope was to do a full EPCM plus commissioning phase of the underground component, uh, working for ACES Delta, and it's a joint venture between uh, Magnum and Mitsubishi. Um, very quickly, a project status. As you can see, it was not an easy winter in Utah. Oh, I would say that summer was, was way more pleasant. Um, we got windshield factor temperature to minus 10 Fahrenheit in some days. Very rough for the team to work under those conditions. We got notice to proceed from the client at the beginning of June of 2022. And as of today, we have drilled both uh, wells up to about uh, 1,700 meters with a 16-inch uh, production casing set in place uh, and both MITs uh, for both wells, MIT meaning mechanical integrity test, have been conducted successfully. Therefore, we are, start, we are gearing up to start the solution mining process at the end of April uh, with an um, estimated a uh, volume of about 19,000 liters per minute. That's about 5,000 gallons per minute uh, for many, many months. Um, as a summary, um, before we go to the QA session, um, yes, high level looking ahead, uh, energy storage and the hydrogen economy, um, according to McKenzie, this is going to be a huge market. And we see a lot of activity already by the private industry, both utility companies, upstream, midstream companies, and developers really moving very, very quickly into this space and investing real money ahead of the IRA or hydrogen hubs. A nomination at the end of 2023. Uh, just by looking at the top 200 companies, uh, the amount of energy that they will demand is, is just incredible. And if we make a quick comparison to the natural gas sector, where at any given moment between 10 and 15% of the total natural gas is stored at any time, that will give us uh, also a significant volume of hydrogen that will need to be stored underground one more point of another. Okay, Karina, I think I'm four minutes late, uh, but I'll be happy to to answer some, some questions. Very good. Uh, we received one question from the audience. What is the risk and potential impact to hydrogen explosion with the proposed hydrogen storage? Also, is the location of hydrogen storage something that will be an issue to source to, to explosion risk? Of course, we always look at explosion risk and try to mitigate it. So right now, and for many, many decades, uh, hydrogen has been stored on the surface, either in tanks or in spheres, that has a higher risk profile than to storing underground. When you store hydrogen underground, it is confined by the carbon, by the well bore, by the well head, and are properly designed. And um, it has a very similar behavior to natural gas. And we have hundreds of natural gas caverns uh, all across uh, different geographies, mostly in Canada and in the US. And the, the, the risk is uh, mitigated properly. Very good. Uh, I think we can refer also to the questions that were submitted uh, before. Ah, I see some questions coming in. Let me uh, share them with you so that we can continue and maximize the time. What is the path forward to hydrogen as an automobile fuel or mass use? Well, this is a very interesting concept because the transportation industry is so important in every single country. So. Uh, in the last few years, there has been quite an advance in different, in different areas. One is the use of hydrogen fuel cells for forklift. And we see top tier companies like Amazon, Walmart, and Home Depot using hydrogen power fuel cells in their warehouses. And it's working very well. I think that's very, very promising. We see also some uh, market leaders, especially for bus fleets and trucks, 
and trains to start using hydrogen fuel cells. If you go and do a quick search, you see big, big names moving to that space. What it could happen is um, for a, a high volume or heavy, heavy weight uh, mass transit solutions, hydrogen fuel cells could be a cheaper and a lighter solution than um, electrical, electrical batteries. Of course, there are some uh, logistic challenges. Where do I produce my hydrogen? How do I produce? Uh, transport my hydrogen to the point of use. How do I refuel those those tanks? Uh, but uh, I'm sure the industry will be able to solve those issues in the next few years. Uh, what opportunities for international collaboration across WSP teams can be explored? We have a growing gas industry teams with in transportation pipeline sector in WSP UK. So we have a global team, and the UK is part of that, uh, among many different other uh, WSP operations. As a matter of fact, I spent an hour this morning talking to our um, UK colleagues on some, on some projects. And the UK especially has a very clear path forward on HiNet, which is a government-driven um, project to decarbonize the, the different industrial clusters by introducing hydrogen in natural gas pipelines. The government has made public, they want to develop about 1.3 terawatt hour of uh, underground energy. That's roughly four times the size what we have seen in, in, in Utah. Uh, they will be looking at developing 19 caverns of, of significant volumes. So yes, there are many opportunities for uh, collaboration uh, among different geographies. It's important that um, we, we keep on building capabilities, we stay focused on the market, we stay focused on reasonable opportunities and share knowledge uh, across uh, WSP. Um, how can hydrogen meet tomorrow's energy demand, given that there is currently no excess electricity sources sufficient or producing hydrogen for future needs? That's another very smart question. So, uh, to produce hydrogen, it has to make sense. It has to be economically feasible. It's not going to be cheaper than current solution, but it is a future ready mentality. Uh, it's probably very expensive for some geographies and it, it could uh, penalize some, some economies. So it has to be a reasonable approach. We have to build renewable energy sources. And when that, that's taking place, the, the most efficient way is to connect renewable energy sources directly to the, to the network. If you're going to produce hydrogen, there is a number of inefficiency. So as I said from the beginning of my presentation, it has to make economic sense. We have to be reasonable. We cannot be distracted by flashy uh, opportunities. We, we have to look at the bottom line when we, we, we face these this projects. One last question. If you want to pick, we received a lot of questions, so. Oh, I don't see any other question, Karina, here in the chat. No. Um, I can read one to you. Is it possible to convert natural gas transportation pipelines to uh, transport hydrogen to markets in order to optimize investment cost? Uh, there is a lot of debate and studies about that, um, especially that's, that's one of the hydrogen strategy backbone in Europe and, and in the UK because they have an extensive network of um, natural gas pipeline and they don't have all the geology to store significant amount of hydrogen underground. Uh, there is also some studies going on in the in the US. Uh, it has many technical implications. It's not going to be an easy solution. A significant amount of money needs to be invested, um, uh, and also the risk of uh, what's happening with the hydrogen once it is injected in the pipeline. So, uh, I think it, it will be a wonderful uh, solution because it, it will solve part of the problem of transporting hydrogen from those areas where there is high um, high uh, potential of renewable energy to those areas where energy is consumed. Um, however, th this is still working pro in progress. 
Thank you very much, Andres, for a very insightful presentation. Thank you to all our participants for joining us today. And we're going to wrap up the webinar now. Thank you. Okay, thank you all.